Hello and welcome to Shooting the Breeze podcast. This is the formal podcast of WaltonPA.com and this is episode 7. The episode that almost didn't make it, or or I, I probably shouldn't say almost didn't make it on time because it, we really do have the potential for this podcast to be late and I'm really pushing the envelope as far as last minute uh, kind of a thing. See... Uh, generally, what I do is I post these videos on a Tuesday. Tuesday morning, I work from home, so uh, being able to upload the video in the background as I work it makes things easier, and then I can just kind of push it to my blog and push it to YouTube and things like that. So uh, it just makes it easier and convenient to do it on a Tuesday morning. And I've gotten into this routine where every Tuesday morning I do the same thing, and I get the podcast up, and you know, and and I'm happy with the result. Well, here we are, Tuesday morning. It's a little after 5 a.m. And uh, it's it's really going to come down to the wire this time around. Um, I'm not quite sure how much actual podcasting and editing I'm going to be able to do before I have to start working. So we're just going to have to play this by ear and see how it works. So how did all this come, come about? Well, I've had a, a pretty busy week and weekend. Now, generally I post these on Tuesday, as I mentioned. So I like to hold off until at the very latest Saturday before I record another podcast. That allows me to to read up on more featured content and news so that I'm not, I don't know, I, I'm not digging too deep to try to grab some content for the podcast. I want some, some newer stuff. And by waiting until Saturday, I have a little bit of that newer stuff. So Friday was out of the question anyway, even though I did have a little bit of free time. I thought I felt it was too early and I didn't see enough content to to use for the show. Well, Saturday I was down in Delaware for the Delaware Cigar Festival, uh, covering it as a member of the press for Stogie Review. And I wound up having a great time, but I was there uh, for several hours. It was a couple of hours down, a couple of hours back. By the time I got home later on that evening, I had had too many cigars to sit down and have another one for the, for the cigar drink pairing portion of the podcast. So I, I did a little bit of photo editing for the for the event and then called it a night and then on Sunday I was all scheduled to do this very informal match at a local range and it was basically a two-gun match it was a pistol and or rifle um, I since I don't have a, a carbine for the match I was just gonna go shoot pistol and you know just go and have fun it was a very laid-back easygoing match and you know, it wasn't being taken very seriously. I mean, the safety, they take seri- safety very seriously, but, you know, the, you know, they're not too concerned about score and things like that, so, and technique or, or any of that stuff. So, I was going to go and have fun, but I learned about this, this match on the Pennsylvania Firearm Owners Association Forum, and somehow I got my threads crossed. I, I wound up referencing the event to, to, make, to double check the time, and I saw that it was canceled. Well, I was actually looking at a thread from the month before. So I, I set aside time on the calendar. I, I blocked out my schedule. I was going to go do the match. And then, you know, when I was referencing the time to double check, I see that it's canceled. And then I, I wound up just sitting around the house, finishing up photo editing in the morning. And then I, I did some painting and stuff like that. I was, go- I, was, I was actually going to head over to the range to do a little bit of shooting. But just decided I, I had other things I wanted to do and get a little bit of stuff together for this podcast was one of them. So I didn't wind up doing it on Sunday. And then Monday rolls around, which is the day that I like to do it. If I'm going to do it last minute, Monday night is usually the, the night to do it. Well, I was going, I went down to see my nephew for his birthday. So I didn't have the opportunity to record it last night. So here we are, bright and early on Tuesday morning trying to get this podcast out because I refuse to push it a day and post it on Wednesday because, you know, I resist change, I guess. And uh, I I just want to get this podcast up on Tuesday. So that is the, that's where we're at as far as why this podcast is, may be running late, but, and why I've got this morning throaty voice and and the, and the show has just become a total train wreck. Um, throughout the week, I haven't found much of anything to use. As far as news goes, back when I first started doing this podcast, Google News was picking up a lot of self-defense stories, and it was really easy to find things to, to inject into the podcast that were kind of upbeat for gun owners. But 
over the past couple of weeks, I'm seeing less and less self-defense stories and more politics and more anti-gun stuff. So it's been getting harder and harder to find news, and I'm seeing a lot of the same thing repeated over and over and over again. One of the news items I have today, I must have seen it at least two dozen times in the past two weeks. So nothing, I don't know, it's political, it's not completely relevant to the the right now it's something that's been ongoing but we'll talk about that uh as far as the featured content goes things have been really slow there too a lot of the blogs that i follow haven't really posted anything that have grabbed my attention uh one blog that i really like to to grab content from uh i i guess they're trying to be clever some of the stuff that they've been posting lately is just i ended up reading three quarters of it and then just i i stop and ask myself why am i reading this it's this is not for me, and then I wind up walking away from it, but that's uh, totally something different. Um, I had something in mind for a discussion topic. I don't remember what it was. I never, did, I never did jot it down in my notes. And for a cigar and drink pairing, well, I was going to do an Opus X, but it's a little after 5 a.m., and there's no way I'm going to smoke an Opus X this early in the morning. I've done it once in my life, and I did not feel very well afterwards. If you're not familiar with an Opus X, it's a, it's a very, very full-bodied cigar, very powerful, and uh, it's recommended that you smoke those later in the day, not first thing in the morning. So the, the cigar and drink pairing is all screwed up because I'm not smoking the cigar I intended to smoke. I'm smoking something else, which I just found in the cooler, and I've got a cup of coffee. So we'll talk more about that later. But at any rate, let's roll into the show and let's get started with the news. There's no sense in me blabbering on anymore. I mean, we're, it's getting later and later. My time frame is shrinking and I'm, I haven't even started the show yet. So let's get started. All right, let's get started with the news. I've only got two news items for you at this point in time. If something miraculously appears in my Google News for podcasts f- folder, it eh, between now and when it's time to wrap up the news, we'll use it, but so far it's looking like two news items. And the first one actually has two pieces of news, so maybe we can cheat it and say that we've got three. So, first and foremost, this particular news article comes from the Courier Press, Evansville Courier and Press, and it is entitled, Gun Toting Man at Mesker Zoo Causes Commotion. And this was published on September 19th, so it was very recent. And the the news article goes on to say, A man who caused a commotion recently when he refused to conceal his handgun while at the Mesker Park Zoo and Botanic Garden was, was within his rights to do so. But law enforcement and gun rights experts questioned why he chose not to conceal the weapon when asked. According to the Evansville Police Department incident report, two officers responded to a call from zoo officials on September 10th after several patrons complained about a man at the facility who had a handgun holstered visibly on his hip. When one of the officers asked the man to conceal the weapon, the man refused and started causing a scene, according to the report. At that point, according to the report, officers asked the man to leave the zoo because he was frightening other patrons. He initially refused to leave the and police had to escort him out. In Indiana, a licensed handgun does not have to be concealed, but Brian Lee can't pronounce your last name, an an Indianapolis attorney and the author of Indiana Firearm Law Reference Manual, said licensed gun owners should use prudence when deciding whether to conceal their weapons. He said the police were also correct to request the man hide the gun from public view. I think the person is within their rights to say, I'm not going to do it, but why would you want to pick a fight if you're a gun owner and the other per- if you're a gun owner or other person that lawfully has it has one wow i'm really bombing this little paragraph here let's start over i think the person is within their rights to say i'm not going to do it but why would you want to pick that fight if you're a gun owner or other person that lawfully has it is one that i wouldn't pick he said, There is a lot of ambiguity between right and wrong and the law of common sense, and, that, and that's a common sense question. Evansville's police department spokeswoman Karen... Oh, wow, these people have really complicated last names. Kajmanwitsk said zoo officials were correct to notify police, even though the man's actions were not against the law. 
She also noted that if the incident had escalated further, the officers could have arrested the man for disorderly conduct, not because of the firearm, but because of his actions toward police and other zoo patrons. Any time that someone has disrupted, has... Oh, man, it is way too early to be doing this new stuff. Any time that someone has disruption like that, and it's causing problems, and people... And people to leaving because of someone's presence, absolutely, let us determine if it is legal or not. Does this par? I mean, are these paragraphs making sense? In my head, they sound weird, so I'm stumbling all over them. I'm reading them as they're written. I'm not taking any liberties here. <laughs> so I'm just saying. <laughs> okay. Um, Kaj Moix? Question the man's motives to display a weapon in the area where children were present, including his own. He felt like it was his right to carry it like that. It is not legal to it is not illegal to carry it that way, and I don't want it to come across that it is, but when you are making that many people uncomfortable, I don't know what purpose you are serving, she said. Katie Nimich, a spokeswoman for Mayor Jonathan Weisenpeffel. <laughs> Uh, said city officials plan to discuss the any the, the, to to discuss the any policy changes regarding firearms on all city property, not just the zoo, which said was prompted by the incident. But it is unclear of what, if anything, they would do. A recently passed state law, authorized by Senator Jim Torres or Tomez. Republican Wadensville prohibits local governments from regulating firearm possession on the on most county and city property, which would include the zoo. However, the law exempts facilities with a courtroom in them, such as the Civic Center, which where firearms are banned. I really apologize for butchering that article, but some of it just did not make sense I was re as I was reading it. And as those letters or words were strung together in this in this form that didn't make sense, I began stumbling. And the last names, wow, I really butchered that. I should probably read this all over again, but that's not how we do things here at uh, Shooting the Breeze podcast. We shoot from the hip, and uh, and you've got yourself one butchered news article. So this is kind of interesting, because here we have a, a classic case of open carry in a state that allows it, uh, people getting upset that they see a gun in public view, they call the police. The police arrive, ask the man to cover his weapon, which is not illegal. He's, he's, he's uh, following the letter of the law. His gun is shown. It's open carried. Uh, it's his decision. It's, and it's, it's his right to do so because there's no law telling him otherwise. He refuses, and the police escort him off public property. So it sounds pretty interesting, right? Uh, well, the plot thickens. Because there's actually a court report, because there's a there's a, a court case being filed over this. Uh, I believe it's a, a civil suit filed against the police department for their actions, and it reads a little differently than the news article does. There's a there's a press release on this from, I believe it's his attorney, and I'm not going to read the, the whole legalese initial part, but the, the meat of this press release is, says as follows. On September 10th, 2011, Mr. Megenheimer, his wife and four-month-old child were enjoying an afternoon in the petting zoo of the Mesker Park Zoo and Botanical Garden owned by and operated by the Evansville Department of Parks and Recreation. Mr. Megenheimer was lawfully carrying a handgun at the time with his Indiana license to carry a handgun in his possession. After a zoo employee apparently called police, Mr. Megenheimer was approached by four members of the Evansville Police Department who first ordered him to conceal his firearm, which he had no legal obligation to do then ordered him to leave the zoo property when Mr. Megenheimer attempted to explain to the officers that their actions were illegal, the officers forcibly removed him from the property. The actions of the EPD and zoo personnel clearly violate Indiana law by enforcing a legal policy regulating firearms and or the carrying of firearms by a unit of local government. 
As such, both the city and DPNR are liable to Mr. Megenheimer for damages, attorney fees, declaratory relief, and injunction relief. The suit was filed with the Clerk of Circuit and Superior Courts of Vanderburg County in Evansville, Indiana. For information, for more information, contact the uh, the attorney. Um, going a little bit further, uh, the complaint plaintiff brings the action against the city of Evansville uh, and Parks and Recreation. Yada yada yada. The code numbers, the background information, all of it is here, and it's pretty interesting. Actually, all of the... I don't remember seeing all of the additional information as far as the complaint and things go. So that's new. I haven't read it, but I will read it. But anyway, the, the press release reads very different from the news article. And it's it's interesting in the sense that uh, we uh, Pennsylvania is also an open carry state. And we sometimes we see issues pop up with, with open carry and police officers deciding that it is illegal when it is not or not knowing that it is legal and forcing the issue on open carry on, on citizens that are open carrying and we recently had um, or it wasn't terribly recently but there was an issue that popped up in Philadelphia where uh, a guy from the Pennsylvania Area Firearm Owners Association was walking I, I believe he was walking from his mother's house to an auto parts store and he was he was screamed at at gunpoint by police who had saw him open carrying his pistol which was not illegal and I'm not quite sure I haven't been following the thread but I believe there's a civil case going on about that whole issue or there will be over uh, over detaining him and things like that and uh, they had him at gunpoint for quite a while there's actually audio of the uh, the incident which uh, a lot of it I listened to but it's, it's been a little while I don't remember the the finer points I just remember a lot of profanity screamed at this guy for op for doing something that was completely legal completely legal and here we have another situation where a guy is out open carrying his gun which is not illegal and people see the gun and get upset um, you know there are a lot of things that I see while I'm out out of my house that make me uncomfortable but there is where is you know, where do you draw the line just because something makes you uncomfortable doesn't mean that you have the right to have police you know storm in and make this person comply to make you feel comfortable if you live in an open carry state get over it you're going to see a gun at some point in time when someone's hip open carried and there's nothing wrong with that uh, it's no different from a police officer walking down the street with an open carried gun on holstered on his hip um, we have two people following the law, or, or, uh, or not breaking the law, so just, uh, I don't know. Open, cho open carry may not be your flavor of uh, carrying a weapon. It's not mine, but, you know, it is what it is. It's not illegal. I don't know. Get over it. All right, well, that was the first piece of news I have for you, and this is the, the last piece because nothing of interest popped up in my Google Reader so we're just gonna read this one and then that'll be the end of the news this one comes from uh, time.com it is an opinion piece and it is based off of a news article that I featured oh, a, a few episodes back if you're if, if you if you've been following the episodes you remember one where I talked about uh, a Florida law being passed that that barred doctors from inquiring about firearm about their patients having firearms in the home if there were children present things like that and my opinion at the time was that a doctor shouldn't be able to question you on what you have in your home and then and then go about telling you how to store it how to care for it how to to protect the other people in your home and and in that article, that news article, there were talks of, you know, uh, the doctor could be liable uh, in, a, in a civil matter for not discussing, you know, the, the proper use and storage of firearms, regardless of whether or not they, they, they had any experience with it. And, you know, there were, there were talk of, well, you know, if, I, if the doctor doesn't, doesn't discuss it with the patient, then the patient could sue the doctor if anything happened, which I think was completely bogus. But... Uh, this article is on a recent uh, change in that law. And uh, anyway, 
Kids and Guns, Why Doctors Have a Right to Know. This was published on September 19th, and it reads as follows. A federal court has blocked a new federal law that limited the ability of doctors to ask patients if they had guns in the home. Judge Monica Cook, a Republican appointee, rightly said that the law interfered with both doctors' right to free speech and the patient's right to information. The ruling, which came down last week, struck an important blow for freedom of expression, but did something more. It dealt a rare setback to gun rights lobby that is increasingly using its considerable political power to support policies that have little to do with the right to bear arms and needlessly put innocent people at risk. Residents of Florida have nearly unrestricted freedom to bear arms. They can have them at home and they can carry them while in public. They can brandish their guns openly or conceal them, except in a few places such as federal buildings and polling places. Before we go any further, um, I doubt that anyone in Florida can, can brandish their gun without causing unrest or drawing police presence. Brandish means wave about. Uh, just carrying a gun and it being in view is not brandishing a gun. I just wanted to clear that up. Because the government does so little to interfere with gun ownership, gun rights proponents have had to look hard for have ha have had to look hard for things to complain about. Florida's firearm owners policy or owners privacy law, the state the statue that was blocked last week was signed into law in June after an incident in which a doctor told the mother of a patient that she would have to she would have to find a new pediatrician if she would not say whether she had guns in her home. You know what, this whole thing is a train wreck anyway, so I might as well just keep stopping and interjecting my opinion. Um, you know what, I this is where I agreed with this particular law. Here we have a pediatrician who's asking about what's in the patient's home. And because he doesn't like the answer, or he doesn't feel as though the, the parent is going to give him a sufficient answer, or any answer at all, he decides to tell this woman, okay, find a new doctor. Okay, I can understand that. Um, there is nothing that says that you have to do business with everyone. You can, you know, as a business owner, you can pick and choose who you do business with. And if this pediatrician doesn't feel comfortable with being this woman's doctor or this this child's doctor, then I can understand him leaving. But here's a, and this isn't the first time I've seen uh, reports of uh, a doctor deciding that they're not going to treat a patient because they have guns in the home or because they won't answer a question regarding guns in the home. Personally, I don't answer questions regarding guns in the home. And if my doctor were to ever tell me that he can, he or she does not feel comfortable being my doctor if I'm not going to be open with them, I'll just find a new doctor. Um, with pediatricians, it's, it's really tough. If my, if my pediatrician said, look, if you're not going to tell me about guns in the home or you're not going to fill out the, the answers on this form or fill out the questions on these forms, then you're going to have to find a new pediatrician. You know, I'd have to, to think long and hard about that. I mean, my gut tells me find a new pediatrician, but I really like the doctor that my daughter goes to, so it would be tough. And I understand where this law is coming from in the sense that you, you, you're, you I don't know, maybe you're kicking gun owners while they're down or something, uh, or not necessarily while they're down, but, you know, you're, you're denying them coverage just because they have a gun in the home or they won't tell you whether or not they have a gun in their home. Personally, I don't think it's any of the doctor's business. And, you know, as far as a civil suit goes, I, I don't see how that can come about. I mean, I could be wrong, but it just doesn't make any sense to me. You don't hear doctors asking about seatbelt usage and being sued because they're not properly uh, instructing their patients how to use a seatbelt or how to care for their pool or how, you know, make sure they lock the fence around their pool, that kind of thing. So, rant, little side rant over. The law is not about preventing the government from interfering with people's right to own and use guns. It is about private doctors asking their patients questions for which they have good medical reasons. I still don't see the good medical reasons part, but I, I digress. <laughs> Pediatricians routinely inquire about health and safety risks to their young patients. That, that can include whether a child wears a bicycle helmet, whether there are household chemicals or alcohol within reach, and whether there are firearms in the home. More than 3,000 children and teens were killed by guns and more than 20,000 injured in recent years. And the rate of child deaths, injuries, and suicides is far higher in homes where guns are present. I'm just curious about all these numbers. How many of these, these injuries to, to, to minors were... Uh, 
gang related or or anything like that uh, it did that just that statistic sounds incredibly high for firearm accident for a child finding a gun in their parents home that was unlocked or whatever and then injuring themselves but again I digress supporters of the Florida law argued that it was necessary to protect the segment second amendment right to bear arms but it isn't as judge cook has noted a doctor who asked about guns in the home is in no way interfering with the patient's right to continue own or possess firearms I agree with that the fact is, in Florida and nationwide, the basic right to have a gun for self-defense is more secure than it has been in decades. Gun rights advocates won a huge victory in 2008 when the Supreme Court ruled in the District of Columbia v. Heller that the Second Amendment prohibits, the, prohibits most restrictions on the right to own a gun for self-defense. With that right now well entrenched, however, the gun lobby has increasingly been fighting for principles that elevate gun rights to troubling extremes. When Arizona Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords was shot in January, an attack in which six people were killed and 13 seriously injured, it called attention to high capacity clips, which allowed a gunman with a single handgun to shoot many people very quickly. Using a high capacity clip, Giffords assailant fired 31 bullets in rapid succession. Similar clips were used in, Hall in Columbine, Columbine high school shootings, the Virginia Tech attacks, and the recent massacre of 68 people in a Norwegian youth camp. I'm not quite sure what this article has anything to do with high capacity clips, which are actually magazines, but uh, you know, it goes on and on. Under the 1994 federal assault weapons ban, it was illegal to sell high capacity clips but that law lapsed in 2004. A new bill introduced by New York Representative Karen, Carolyn McCarthy, whose husband was murdered by a crazed gunman on the Long Island Railroad in 1993, would reinstate the high-capacity clips ban. But the gun lobby is bitterly opposed, and the bill appears to be going nowhere. Gag rules for doctors and protection for high-capacity clips are not the only troubling position the gun lobby has staked out. Gun rights advocates steadfastly defend the so-called gun show loophole, which allows people to buy firearms at gun shows without the federal background checks that are required for purchases in stores. As a result of the loophole, criminals and terrorists have have a place they can go to buy weapons, no questions asked. Um, you know, I'm not I'm not aware of any loophole. I keep hearing talks of this loophole. I really don't know what it is. Um, if anyone out there is listening to this or watching this and you're well versed on this loophole, I'd really love to know for informational purposes. Um, I'm th there are no restrictions on me walking into a gun store and buying a gun, so I really don't need a loophole. Um, but I'd be interested to to, un to understand what this loophole is that keeps being brought up about gun shows, because as far as I know, you go through the background checks as you would anything else, or as you would in a store, and I'm not quite sure what the issue is here. Anyway, the the. We're almost done. The uh, goes on to say, a bill introduced in the House of Representatives earlier this year would have blocked gun purchases by people on the FBI's terrorist watch list. It should have passed unanimously. Really, who wants to be sus to see suspected terrorists loading up on assault weapons? But the gun lobby argued ferociously that the bill could infringe on the Second Amendment rights of anyone put on the list by mistake. In May, the bill died in committee. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm I'm in agreement that what happens if you get put on that list by mistake. It is time for a little more common sense. Gun rights supporters can protect people's ability to use guns for self-protection without fighting for the right to use clips that can kill 31 people at a pop, or helping terrorists buy guns, or telling pediatricians they can't they can't try to keep their young patients away from a major cause of accidental death. That's the end of the article. Oh, this is just so filled with anti-gun. It's nauseating. I couldn't help myself. I just had to comment as we were going along. Um, so there you have it. I think I said everything I had to say throughout the article. And we can leave it at that. So that is going to wrap up the news. All right. Well, at this point in the show, I generally cover some featured topics. Uh, I... I scour the web, I, I tell you about some really cool stuff that I find, and I suggest you go check it out. Um, I'm not going to do that this time. Well, I am, but not in this order. Uh, as you can see, I had to pop the bands off of my cigar, and it's getting quite short. 
or it's beginning to get short. And uh, I thought I would do the cigar and beverage portion of the podcast now rather than later as I'm smoking down this little tiny little nub. So, <clears throat> excuse me, while we're out of order, <clears throat> I might as well talk about this the cigar and drink pairing. So, as I said earlier, it's, uh, it's pretty early in the morning. It's a little after 6 a.m. Uh, I should be working at this point, which means I'll be working later in the day to make up for the time lost now. But... It's early in the morning, and I'm not going with an adult beverage at this point in time. Uh, I'm drinking coffee. It's just caribou stuff through a Keurig machine. Really nothing fancy to talk about. But the cigar is a La Aurora 1495 BME Dominican. And what this is, is it the BME stands for Brick and Mortar Exclusive. Uh, a while back, La Aurora wanted to produce a cigar that was that was beneficial to cigar shops, brick and mortar being um, your local cigar shop and not your internet retailer. So they came out with a cigar that was only available in these brick and mortars, hence brick and mortar exclusive, which was different from what you could find online. Now this, the price of the cigar was a little higher because it's, it's, it's meant for brick and mortar stores which have a higher overhead than, than online retailers. But it was different in the sense that this particular cigar comes with a Sumatra wrapper, Corojo binder, and the fillers are Peruvian, Corojo, Nicaraguan, and Piloto Cubano. And that make, and I believe it's a special size too. Um, actually, I think it's only available in one size, and I'm not, I'm not really sure what that particular size is. This was a trade show sample that's been sitting in my cooler since, or sitting in my cooler since uh, IPCPR in. 2010 down in New Orleans. Uh, I smoke these from time to time. They're they're pretty good. I think they're between like seven and eight dollars a piece. Uh, they're good medium-bodied cigars. They have a nice creamy texture to them. Uh, the the most notable flavor that I get out of these cigars is kind of like a nutty and woody flavor. And I find that they go really well with coffee. They have uh, again that creamy texture seems to go well with black coffee. It's the only way I drink coffee. I don't like cream and sugar. And the, the balance of a little bit of bitterness from the coffee with the creaminess of the cigar seems to pair really well. So that is the cigar and drink pairing recommendation for the episode. And I completely forgot to tell you that uh, this portion of the podcast is sponsored by Stogie Review. So at this point in time, I'm going to lead you into a little promo video from Brian, which you've seen numerous times. One day I'll get video from Jerry and Mike to insert here as well or to trade off with the video with Brian. But uh, sit tight, watch what Brian has to say, and I'll be right back getting into the featured topics or the featured content portion of the podcast. Hey, it's Brian here from Stogie Review. If you like cigars, and I'll bet you do, how about you go over and check out stogiereview.com. Just, uh, you know, it's a bunch of guys. We uh, smoke a lot of cigars, we talk about them, we tell you what we think. You know you can trust me because I'm wearing my thinking glasses. So check it out, stuggyreview.com. Alright, well before we get into the featured content portion of the show, I forgot to mention my preferred cigar retailer. Uh, if you're interested in picking up some of the La Aurora 1495 BMEs, as I said, you, you can't order them online. However, you can pick up the phone and give Mike down at Buckhead Cigar a call. Uh, Mike is located down in Atlanta, Georgia, and he is more than willing to ship product to customers. Uh, Mike is a very big Miami Cigar account, so I would imagine that he has the La Aurora 1495 BME, and uh, I'm sure his price is, is uh, competitive. I've, I've been using Mike for cigar purchases for quite a while now, ever since my local closed. Uh, he has become more or less my local retailer, even though he is located all the way down in Georgia. So if you're interested in, uh, in picking up some of these 1495 BMEs, give Mike a call and uh, try them out. Let me know what you think. All right, so it's time for the featured content portion of the podcast, and I've got three items. I only had two up until yesterday afternoon when uh, Corey, a uh, longtime poster on the website, was kind enough to send me a piece of information relating uh, something that I was looking into recently. And I thought, you know what, this is a really well-written article. I'm going to use it for the, I'm going to include it in the featured 
content portion of the podcast and round out my three pieces of information. So thanks, Corey, for the information. That will be the last portion that I discuss. But first is... <clears throat> Excuse me. Gargoyles Ballistic Eye Protection from Caleb over at Gun Nuts. Now, this particular article talks a little bit about uh, Gar- Gargoyles brand eye protection for range use. Now, these glasses are fairly expensive <clears throat> as far as safety glasses are concerned, but looking over the, the product, they look pretty cool. And he goes on to say that they're very comfortable. He can He can wear them for extended periods of time. And even though they are expensive, he feels as though they are well worth the money. And when I read this, I thought, you know what, this is kind of interesting because back when I was doing cabinet work, I would spend, you know, anywhere between 8 and 12 hours in a cabinet shop, and except for lunch, I would have safety glasses on the entire time, and I refused to wear the uh, the really inexpensive, you know, 2 or $3 pairs of safety glasses that most people will give you or most employers will provide you for free because they weren't comfortable to wear for extended periods of time. And what I wound up doing was I would look through the catalog. Uh, I think it was Air Gas that was uh, the supplier of safety equipment that we were buying from. And uh, I wound up buying a fairly expensive pair of safety glasses. I think they were like 50 some dollars. And uh, they had interchangeable lenses. You could swap them out or replace them. And they were really comfortable on my head. Well, The issue that I used to have was the... Uh, the arms would either pinch my ears because they were too tight or my nose would get pinched and and wearing them for extended periods of time these regular safety glasses were were uncomfortable so I bumped up to this more expensive pair and they were awesome you'd forget you were wearing them they were extremely comfortable and it, I, it's it's kind of funny that I haven't applied that same principle to shooting I'll go to the range and I'll throw on a cheap pair of Walmart yellow tinted safety glasses or shooting glasses and you know I'll just fire away at the range they're not particularly comfortable, but I've never had to wear them for an extended period of time. Um, I, I, at some point in time, I would like to upgrade to a more quality set for when I go to matches and stuff where I'm, where I'm wearing them for five or so hours. But this is kind of an interesting look and made me think back to my, my woodworking days when I had to wear safety glasses for an extended period of time. So if, uh, if you're interested in, in quality shooting glasses, check out... Uh, Caleb's right up on the Gargoyles brand, and uh, check them out. Let me know what you think. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sort of in the market. I mean, I don't want to purchase an expensive set right now. I've got other things I want to buy. If, you know, for the time being, the, the, the cheapies from Walmart are getting the job done, but check it out. It's, it's pretty interesting, and it's a brand that I wasn't aware of. All right, I realize I'm, I'm, I'm skimming through this featured content stuff kind of quick, but I'm pushing about 40 minutes. I spent a bit too much time on the news, so I want to kind of get through this so that I can talk a little bit about a featured discussion topic that I had in mind, and I don't want to do a disservice to any of this stuff, but all of it is well worth reading. So the second piece of featured content is entitled What Happens in the Range from Miguel over at Gun Free Zone. And uh, the picture says it all in this in this really short write-up. There is a picture of a guy at an IDPA match. He's laying on the ground. He's more or less laying on his stomach, canted to the side a little bit. And they have a dummy laying on top of him. And when I first saw that, I'm thinking, what is going on here? Well, it's it's an IDPA stage where you're... You, it, which simulates sort of like uh, a mass shooting where you may have a body laying on top of you. And the objective is to fire your gun from laying on the ground at the attacker targets. And I thought, you know, this is really cool. I've I've shot USPSA, and it was a lot of fun. It's a lot of running around and shooting. The round counts are high. But, you know, IDPA really has some of the coolest stages I've ever seen. Uh, He says that a lot of people didn't want to do this because you have this dummy laying on top of you. But... You know, just looking at it, I just think that this is a really cool stage, and it's it's definitely something to look at. Um, to go along with this, I recently saw a video from the Gun Dudes on Facebook. Uh, one of the guys was at uh, an IDPA state match, and they had this, like, paratrooper simulator. And basically, it was this contraption that you stood on. It was elevated. You stand on this thing, and it's got this pole that goes up and hooks to a cable and there's another cable that that pulls this thing back you wear a seat belt across your chest and then when the buzzer goes off they begin firing they let the cable go and this thing starts swinging there's a weight on the side and so you get sort of uh, this counterbalanced 
random rotation going on and it's it's supposed to simulate coming down out of the air on a parachute where you're sort of swinging all about and uh, this thing looks super fun and really cool i mean it looks like it'd be really difficult to to complete the stage and and get any rounds on target but you know seeing this idpa stuff these really creative stages is something that i i find really cool and it makes me want to shoot idpa i mean uspsa is really fun but I, i'd love to to try some of these these crazy stages i've i've seen more tame stuff where you're you're seated on top of a motorcycle and you're supposed to fire at targets draw and fire from seat, being seated on the motorcycle firing from in cars and things like that more realistic situations which are which are really cool and something i definitely want to try so head over to gun free zone and check out the picture of this uh this guy laying on the ground with a dummy on top of him it's it's pretty cool us or it's a it's a pretty cool idpa stage all right so we have the last piece of featured content ready to go and as i said earlier this comes from comes courtesy of Corey, who's a longtime commenter on waltonpa.com and um this this one applies to me because i was recently doing this very thing and the the uh the article comes from usa carry and it's entitled painting a pretty site picture <clears throat> and basically it is step-by-step -step instructions for painting your sites now uh in the case of my <clears throat> excuse me smith and wesson m p you have uh the rear sight is it's basically a rear sight it's got a, a cutout in the in the middle of it and it's got a dot on either side and the front sight is a post with a dot in it and when you line up the sights you get three dots all lined up well the dots on my my factory m and p <clears throat> are white and they get a little dirty from time to time and in the case of my M&P, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the front sight dot popped completely out during recoil. Now, this is a fairly common problem from what I understand, and it's really not a big deal. You can easily paint that, paint that little dot. And you're probably thinking, well, you just slap some paint on there. Easy enough, right? Well, there's some prep work that goes into it. You have to, you have to clean that little spot so the paint will, will bite in and bind. Um, it's recommended that you prime that little dot first to brighten the color that you're going to put on top. And before I saw this article, I actually went through and I did all this uh, on my own from stuff that I read on the web. And basically what I decided to use was nail polish. It's hard, it's durable, and you can get it in some pretty wild colors. So I was I was asking around on where I could get like fluorescent road worker green slash yellow paint that would be really really bright and stand out or nail polish and there were a couple of recommendations and people were saying well you know you can just go to walmart or target or walgreens or cvs and and just and get that stuff anywhere it's not special order or anything those wild and crazy colors are pretty common so i go to walmart and i'm like walking around the the cosmetic and beauty aisle for a good 15 minutes trying to find a decent bright nail polish color and i wound up getting something that was just too dark but uh, I did it anyway, and I wasn't happy with it, so I ended up digging through my wife's nail polish and finding some really bright pink stuff that I, I tried. It's also not quite bright enough, but it should get the job done for right now. And basically what you do is you just dip a, a round toothpick into the, into the nail polish and then, da and then dip it into the front sight. The, the, the nail polish will run down the, the toothpick and flow into the divot where the, where the paint goes. And in, in my case, I just filled that whole void, let it harden, and now I've got uh, a bright pink dot on my front sight. Now, it's, it's easy enough to just have the sight swapped out for a fiber optic or something, but if you, if you just need to freshen up your sights or, or create a dot if yours popped out like mine, um, you can read this article and it, it gives you step-by-step -step instructions on how to do it properly so that that dot will stay in there and be very visible to you. So. Pretty interesting article. Thanks again, Corey, for sending it my way. And that's going to wrap up the featured content portion of the podcast. And it's about time for me to roll into the featured discussion portion. So sit tight. I will be right back. All right. Well, looking at the timer, I have about 15 minutes of show to fill to hit my maximum one-hour time limit that I like to hold. However, I'm like running really, really short on time. So I want to kind of breeze through this. I'm running short on time as in I gotta I have to uh, start working from home like really really soon so 
I kind of just want to breeze through this, and I had a topic in mind earlier this week, but I never jotted it down, and I don't remember what it was. And, you know, I was just sort of sitting thinking, you know, what what have I done in guns that's worth talking about, and, you know, what can I use as a, as a discussion topic? And I was really drawing a blank, and I, I was scanning through my email real quick, and I noticed a, a response from an email that I sent out earlier this week inquiring about a local firing range, or a local gun range. So I thought, you know what, I'll talk a little bit about gun clubs and, you know, my experience with them. I'm a member of three different gun clubs in the area. <clears throat> I'm a member of the Muhlenberg Area Shooting Association, which is in Muhlenberg, Pennsylvania, and I've been a member there for the longest period of time. Uh, I, I think I'm going on three years of membership, and I joined that range when I first started shooting because it's local, and it's usually pretty quiet during the day. I mean, I, I usually go first thing in the morning. On the weekend, I'll get there at 8 o'clock on Sunday, I believe, that you're permitted to start shooting, and no one will be there. I, I've shot until 9, 9.30 with no one showing up. And if I go on a Saturday, I think I'm permitted to start shooting at 7. The same thing there, you know, I'll shoot for an hour, hour and a half, and most often I'm there alone. And uh, it's a it's a really convenient range because of how close it is. However, it shares a it's it's basically a field with a common backstop, and your firing lines step back away from that backstop. So the rifle range and the pistol range are combined. So basically the problem being, if you get there in the middle of the day and someone is shooting, you either have to shoot with them or you have to wait until they're done. For example, I, I load up my pistols, I go to the range, and there's someone in there shooting rifle. I either have to shoot at 50 or 100 yards with them, with my pistol, or I have to wait until they're finished so that I can shoot closer. Otherwise I'd be in front of them because the pistol firing line is forward of the rifle firing line. And the same is true as if I get there and I start shooting and someone else arrives and there's a you know you're not supposed to monopolize the the range time so they say 30 minutes max wait time for the person arriving so that everyone can shoot it's a little difficult in the event when someone does show up because then then all of a sudden you feel rushed <clears throat> and uh, it, it, it's kind of a downside but I but, but again the range is close it's dirt cheap I think it's ten dollars a year and I rarely run into a problem with someone else being there and, and holding me up or making me rush through my shooting. But it's a, it's a great range. I really enjoy it. And uh, I would recommend it to anyone in the, in the Muhlenberg area. Even if you're outside the area, I think it's $15 a year for non-Muhlenberg residents. Um, outside of that, I'm also a member of the Daniel Boone Rod and Gun Club. I believe it's in Exeter, Pennsylvania. Uh, I've actually never been there. Um, I, I, I lie. I was there one time to pick up an application. I was there in the evening when they were doing trap shooting in the late fall. I picked up an application. I really couldn't see much outside of the lights over the trap field. Um, the, uh, the membership application was just kind of hanging up on a wall next to a built next to a, a uh, like a bulletin board. Uh, I talked to someone for a whole two minutes. I came home, filled out the application, sent it in with the intention of going there and, and shooting trap. However, there's a two-month uh, lapse in when you send in the application and when you're approved. So two months later, it's snowy, it's icy, and the driveway getting into the place is pretty nasty. So I decide, well, I'm not, I'm not going to take my little sedan into this ice field to try to get into the range. So I wait and I hold off until spring rolls around and I never get around to going and here we are, it's summer and I still haven't gotten around to, to going and we're approaching winter all over again and I still haven't gone. So uh, I really can't tell you anything about that, about that particular range other than they have uh, pistol, rifle, trap, they have an indoor archery range which, is, which requires, uh, I think it's a $40 stamp to use it. Uh, they have fishing, which requires a stamp to use that portion of the club. Um, the The annual membership isn't very expensive, but however, if you want to add on these other things, it can get kind of pricey. So I may or may not let my membership lapse. Uh, I guess it all depends on whether or not I get over there before winter hits and snow and ice start falling. Um, it's it's a great club from what I hear. I just have yet to experience it because, again, I, I just haven't gotten over there.
The last club I'm a member of is Ole Valley Fishing Game. They're about 20, 25 minutes away from home, and they have they have a very active club. Um, they do weekly sporting clays, weekly trap, and weekly skeet. Uh, so during the week, the club is pretty active. They also do monthly sporting clay shoots through the woods, which I've never done, but I hear great things about. Um, they have a 100-yard rifle range, which requires a safety officer and is only open during certain times during the week. And then they have a pistol and rifle range that is max 50 yards and is open uh, during regular shooting hours. Now, the only problem I faced with this club is they are busy. So, if you get there and you want to shoot short pistol at, you know, say, 7 to 10 yards, you're you're pretty much going to end up waiting because there's a lot of rifle guys that show up and use the the 50 yard portion again uh, common common backstop actually they have two there's a 25 yard backstop and a 50 yard backstop the firing line is in the same spot which is covered which is why the rifle guys use it because there's a bench there and stuff so a uh, very active club it allows guests which is great uh, i took a friend over there we did some shooting i'm trying to convince him to, to get over there with me again so that we can do some more shooting and cigar smoking um, they this is this is also the club that did the two gun match that I mentioned earlier, and it looks like they're trying to do one match a month, something like that. And I'm really interested in, in giving it a try because it seems very laid back and friendly, and it looks like it would be a lot of fun. Unfortunately, a lot of these things are two gun matches, and I only have one gun because I don't have a, a long gun um, that I could do these matches with. Uh, I have an SKS, however, it's it's horribly out of sight. And I don't have a sling for it, and I don't have any experience with using a sling, and you know, and I have to manipulate stripper clips for for reloads and things like that. So it's it's not really optimal, and I haven't had any desire to take it out and use it during those two gun matches. But the pistol portion seems like a lot of fun. I saw some pictures of the recent match, and it looked like a, a great time. But the kind of the the whole point of this little discussion was I'm looking into joining another range. Now, I mentioned that I shot a USPSA match back in July, and I had a ton of fun shooting this match, and unfortunately, all of the other clubs that I'm a member of, I don't believe, I, I, only, however, I have shot from the holster. I was instructed to shoot from a holster there, so I would imagine you can. Uh, they also allow fully automatic fire, which which is great, except for I don't have a, a class three uh, fully automatic weapon. However, the other two ranges that I'm a member of don't permit shooting from the holster. You can't shoot from the move. And it can get kind of dicey in the event that multiple people are there because you, you, know, you have to wait for shooting lanes to open up and things like that. But this other club, uh, Topton Fish and Game, they have six pistol ranges. Um, one is private and locked up. The other one, I think, is closed temporarily. But that still allows four ranges that they use for USPSA. So I, I sent off an email asking about the usage of those ranges you know can I shoot on the move can I shoot from the holster uh, the the response I got back was you know I'm not quite sure let me talk to the the person that deals with the pistol stuff and I will get back to you as soon as I can so I'm waiting to hear back from that because if I can shoot on the move and set up my own little mini USPSA uh, stages th that would be fantastic I'll definitely drive a half an hour to do that But in addition, I want to get back into archery. It's been quite a while since I've done it. But they also have an indoor archery range, which is open uh, during regular hours. It doesn't require a special stamp or extra money or anything like that. So um, I, I'm looking at if I can do everything I want to do with pistol, the the uh, the archery portion is just sort of icing on on top of everything. Uh, they have some target butts set up outside for longer range archery. They do uh, a monthly 3D shoot, which looks like a lot of fun from the pictures that I saw. It's been years since I've done that. And uh, they also have uh, trap and I believe three rifle ranges, uh, 50, 75, and, or, or 75, 100, and 200 yard rifle ranges. So it's a, it's, a, and it's a big club and it looks like they offer their membership a lot of benefits. So I'm, I'm still waiting on hearing some information on that. And if I get the green light to to shoot mini USPSA stages at their pistol ranges, I'm definitely going to become a member and uh, and check it out. So I'm, I'm again, I'm running really short on time. I just wanted to talk a little bit about ranges that I'm a member of and where I'm hoping to become a member of. 
and and that's going to close out the show so with that said i really appreciate you taking the time to watch um i would really appreciate some feedback on waltonpa.com you can throw some comments up on the youtube video as well um send in you know emails and stuff like that if you're looking for uh if you're looking to see my opinion on news articles or see news articles featured or things like that and or if you just like to ask me a question or talk to me in general i am walt w on twitter and uh, walt at waltonpa.com as far as an email address goes so again thank you for watching i look forward to hearing your feedback on this particular episode and i will catch you next time hopefully next time this won't be very last minute and the show will be a little better organized but uh, i'll see you later